Okay, let's come to order. Welcome to our policy meeting. Um, you have before you our uh, agenda and supporting documents. I think we have a lot of folks here interested in the supplement booster issue. That's 14 on the agenda. Let's go ahead and move that up to the top unless there's objection from the committee and, and discuss that just to uh, let these folks minds be put at ease. Mr. Gill, do you have anything to say about Yes, sir, I issue? do, but it might be Sage on our part. Let Angel go ahead okay. and address the part. There's some language change in policy. Okay. And then Does anybody I'll, have a packet? Um, the one that you'll be looking for in your packet is co-curricular activities. It's 4.2001. Uh, and what we have done in, in this draft is drafted a policy that includes language allowing outside instruction for um, the third paragraph says uh, private and group instruction in vocal, wind, percussion, string, dance, acting, group vocal, you can read the list. One thing that is not included that, that Mr. Gill and I talked about we do want to include is clubs as well because some clubs like archery, um, a few clubs I know to use outside instructors as well. So this policy would allow um, those groups to have outside instructors. Um, it clarifies that someone who is the sponsor of the program or the teacher in charge of the program would have to be in the vicinity of or on school grounds when the instruction was taking place, that they would be in charge of scheduling the instruction. Um, we have not addressed monetary issues in this draft at this point, but to clarify, we have not had a policy in place before that specifically allowed that kind of instruction. So we did want to put something in place that did allow that kind of instruction. Um, and then if we need to include anything regarding the monetary, we can include that as well. Okay, Harry? <clears throat> yeah, with, and I'm sure that's why there's such a large number here today. With respect to something that's paid to, uh, to folks uh, most particularly affiliated with the band, but I guess all groups actually. Uh, it was never, I don't think the board's intention or my intention to cap those supplements, and I'm not recommending that we do that. Uh, what did capture my attention personally was that there was a 16, I think, an $8,250 uh, supplement paid, which the 16 is roughly half what a first-year teacher makes. So it just kind of caught our attention. Uh, and also, with respect to the other, and I'm certainly not being accusatory, but uh, it could raise some folks in the public's interest if somebody affiliated with a band director or somebody else has paid that large chunk of money. All that said, I don't recommend that we do anything with respect to capping supplements to anybody. Uh, secondly, the board may see it differently. Uh, as Dr. Burns and I talked, since they, we are ultimately approving these supplements anyway, it's probably not necessary to have approval for a large supplement to be paid. But now the board may see it differently. They may want to say, if you're paying a $16,000 supplement out, we want to know in advance uh, of payment. But I'm not recommending that. I, I've heard enough that I'd just soon leave that alone. Well, in essence, that's what we have right now, is that the payment has to go on the consent agenda, and so we have that. I, and, I, and as you said, Mr. Gill, it was never our intention to cap supplements, a lot of rumors floated, Facebook postings and other means of communication uh, sort of fanned the flames, but uh, I don't believe that was ever our intention. So what we have before us is a proposal to actually allow this instruction, which obviously has been going on, but sort of outside of the policy. Um, to clarify too, this does require background checks for those people, which we had already sort of set in right. place, but it will be included in the policy. Right. Questions or comments from the committee? Tim. I, I, I know that uh, in this process we're all interested in just making sure, and I, and I was constantly thinking about what I know, that uh, no children are being deprived of the opportunity. I think that's the, the, the thing we want to make sure that is in place. Uh, I was I think that's important that we recognize that you know things stay within some bounds of what market value is, but there is a market value out there that, that supports those kind of things for excellence. So 
Uh, but I, I had no conversation with any parent or any group that, that has suggested that anybody, any student has been left out of the process because of this. And as long as that's in place, you know, I'm good with it. Yeah, we actually had a meeting with, uh, I think you were in on it, Mr. Platt, with uh, several, with the band directors and cheerleading sponsors. I think Mr. Freitag might have been there. And that was kind of the common denominator is that everybody gets an opportunity. We're not discriminating against anybody. If they can't raise money, uh, they still are allowed to participate. Uh, so that, just to piggyback what you said. Do you need a second? No, I, we have a second. Further discussion? Pardon my late arrival, but just to clarify again, uh, this is for employees that are in our system. Does this also pertain to special uh, employees that come in for a, a, a band camp instruction or something like that? How does this relate to those people? That's specifically what it That's does. What it does specifically what it does. Private and group instruction. Okay. On an ongoing basis, uh, there is some concern of private instruction that might take place on school grounds. Uh, would that require a background check and can it take place during school hours, after school hours? How are we in that regard? Well, this would require any private instruction, anybody providing private instruction to have a background check, yes. It does not clarify during school hours or not during school hours. It just says that the days and times for the group, private and group instruction will be set by the Rutherford County teacher who's connected to the instruction. Okay, and if that takes place, then <laughs> that money for that instruction has to flow through Rutherford County payroll? If is it's that being correct? paid by a private individual? Right. No. 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 Okay, so if it's, paid, if it's paid by an individual. It's paid to a private individual rather than an employee. Right. Then, then they can pay that employee. I mean, they can pay that private that individual. That instructor, right. Yeah. But they report that. They report that as income. Right. Mm -hmm. Other discussion? So everybody clear on what we're voting on? The new po uh, this policy will allow private instruction. It will mandate that private instructors get a background check. And what else, Angel? Liability. Uh, they will have to fill out a liability waiver form, which we will provide to the schools. Uh, they'll keep a copy of that on file in school. I'll keep a copy on file here. Um, and it what, does require someone connected to the instruction right. who is a school employee to be present. To be in, that, in the vicinity. Okay. So there's no prohibition of private instruction. There's no cap on supplements. None of the stuff that uh, has been floating around. Okay. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion's adopted. You all are welcome to stay for the rest of our exciting policy meeting. <laughs> if, however, you prefer to leave at this point, uh, we won't be offended. So thank you for coming out. Appreciate what you do for our uh, students.
version, so I'll try to highlight what is taken out or added. In this policy, um, under safety, where we have listed the high-risk employees, um, the health regulations changed where those were concerned, and so we've updated this policy to include the new list of people who are at risk, and you can see the new list. Um, in the old one, it included physical education teachers, coaches, and cheerleading sponsors, and health occupation instructors, which will not be on the new list. Okay, questions on that one? <coughs> and a motion would be awesome at this time? Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion's adopted. Number two. Okay, if we can kind of take two, three, and four together. Okay. <clears throat> they are separation practices for non-certified employees, support personnel, and compensation guides and contracts. All three of these policies, the changes that we will be proposing, take out the contract language for classified employees and add at-will employment language, which was a change in state law. So in each of these policies, um, in the first one, separation practices under dismissal, where it used to say classified employees have to be suspended and then given an opportunity for a hearing and all those kinds of things, it now just says that they are at-will. Um, so that changes, and we don't have any choice in that change in the law. The second one, uh, the same situation under suspension and dismissal on the second page used to contain all of that language about a hearing. Uh, so we've changed that to the um, at-will language as well. And then in compensation guides and contracts, this policy used to contain language about classified employees having contracts. We've now clarified that certified personnel are the people who have contracts in the system. <clears throat> so it would be primarily stemming from state law right. change that took place last session. Right. Any discussion or a motion? Move to accept all three. Second, I'm sorry. Okay. Called them. Any uh, discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion's adopted. Thing number five is 1.407 school board records. <clears throat> uh, and what we have done in the revision is to add uh, the following language that says in the first paragraph any citizen of Tennessee, state official, or other authorized authorized person shall be permitted upon written request on the form approved by the Tennessee Office of Open Records Council at a reasonable time to inspect records maintained by the school district. We've added that part about the form that would be used. Um, and then on down where it says such requests shall be made to the system's public information officer, that is new language. And then a person who has the right to inspect a record may request and receive copies of the document subject to the payment at reasonable cost established by the Tennessee Office of Open Records Council. So that's what we've added. Um, we have been using that system, but just to clarify, that's who the request goes to, and that's the schedule that we use for fees. And that um, office is designated to help governmental agencies with those kinds of issues. Is this a result of a TSBA recommendation or just some recent experiences we've just had? Just recent. Okay. Mr. Chair, way that those records can be uh, reviewed in person, I mean, without receiving a copy, or is that the, the manner is to receive a copy? No, they have the option to just inspect as well. Okay. Why? In the case of a personal inspection, would you not have to redact somehow? I mean, you just yeah. wouldn't open up a file and say, Yeah, depending Here. on what the request was, there may be information that had to be redacted. Okay. All so right. in that case, they'd have to have a copy, wouldn't they? A copy Not necessarily. I mean, we have people that come in and look at personnel records, and, okay. and we cover social security numbers and, and the items that are, and they don't ever ask for a copy necessarily, but we cover those and sit with them while they're going through the. And then you the uncover way. them later, or you just, I mean, you put a little piece of paper over them? Is that what you're saying? Huh. Duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thousand uses for it. <laughs> Other discussion? All right, we have a motion. Is it? Any other discussion? I missed the motion in the second, I'm sorry. Wayne moved in the uh, 10 seconds. 
No other discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Those say no, motion's adopted. Number six. Number six is 4.400, instructional resources and materials. <clears throat> and the change that we've made in this one, uh, in the first paragraph, we have added, um, Okay, the policy used to say all classrooms and learning centers shall be equipped with an evenly proportioned wide assortment of teaching tools, textbooks, workbooks, audiovisual equipment selected to meet the students' needs. We took out te teaching tools, textbooks, workbooks, and audiovisual equipment and inserted curriculum materials and instructional supplies because that's what the federal title auditors require. So that's what we've added. And then in the second paragraph, I think Don had an issue he might want to discuss about what something that might be changed there as well a dollar amount on it because when you talk about listing instructional materials you got teachers maybe purchased from BEP funds from PTOs from other things I think you'd want some dollar figure maybe a hundred dollars or more or something just like a bid because literally you can come up with thousands of items that wind up using by structure by a teacher in a classroom multiplied by you know the number in the faculty so something so that the list is just not too long <laughs> Don, do you want to make that in the one way? Do we have an emo We don't have a motion to approve yet, I don't think, do we? Yeah. So, Don, would you want to say a list of textbooks and instructional materials valued at over one hundred dollars? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Per item. Yeah, a lot of small stuff. So okay. whoever makes the motion, if Don, you want to make the motion and incorporate that language? Well, I, I would want to uh, amend, amend this policy to add um, uh, one hundred dollars per instructional materials and one hundred dollars per instructional Well, that's why I'm just trying to avoid doing two motions. Just add it. Just add, add, add it to, the, to it. Yeah. How, how did you change? I, well, what I would suggest we do is, is a list of textbook and instructional materials valued at over $100 per item used by the school shall be revised okay. annually. So that's Mr. Odom's motion. Was there a second? Second. Any discussion? Everybody clear on what we're doing here? Okay, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no, motion's adopted. Number seven. Okay, number seven is 5.100, personnel goals. <clears throat> and again, something that the federal auditors have required uh, is that we add a section to this policy it, that's under number one now that says to ensure equival equivalence among schools and teachers, administration, and other staff. Um. It was the primary purpose for putting this policy on the agenda. We have also come across a couple of other things that may need to be changed. <clears throat> for example, number four, to provide an in-service training program for all employees to improve their performance. We think it would be better said to say to provide opportunities for in-service training. Mm -hmm. um, although teachers are required to do a particular amount of in-service, classified employees are not required to, but there are some opportunities for them. And then in number five, um, to conduct an evaluation program and to insert for certified employees that will contribute to continuous improvement of staff performance because those are the ones that we require evaluations of. So classified employees, there's no annual evaluation? I think classified employees at the central office are evaluated but not at the school level. Well, I'm not brave enough to suggest principals do any more evaluations, so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that way. Mr. Horn was giving me a very dirty look, so we'll just move right on. Okay. So, someone want to move we adopt that with the suggestion, with the uh, changes Angel suggests? Is that Donald second? So, again, the, the changes were to change four to say provide opportunities 
and change five to say for certified employees. Is that right? right? And then to add number one. Add number one. And that, you said number one came about because of a federal regulation of some uh, sort? Federal title auditors require very, very specific language. Yeah. Okay. Is it appropriate for us to say certified and central office employees? I mean, that is where we are right now. We're not adding anything there, but it does keep us in line with what we're doing. Well, we only have two types of employees. They're either certified or classified. So, If they're classified at the central office, are there classified employees at the central office? I suppose there are. Yes. yes. Yeah. I guess I'd prefer to leave it to the discretion of the director. I mean, if you put in policy, then he or she has to do it. I mean, right now they could, could choose not to do it, presumably. Okay. But I don't feel strongly. Other discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. Motion is adopted. Number eight. Okay, number eight is 5.304, long-term leaves, leaves of absence for professional personnel. Uh, and what we propose to change in this policy is, <clears throat> in the first paragraph, it previously said that any person holding a position requiring a license to teach may be granted extended leave up to one year for child care after the birth of a child. So what we are proposing to do is to limit that leave to the mandatory requirement of 16 weeks um, rather than the one year. And I, I, at least our discussion up to this point has been that if we make that change, we would make it effective starting next school year. Question, Angel. With respect to any kind of federal legislation on um, maternity leave, is there a, a minimum amount that the government might require? Is it 16 weeks? 16 weeks is what's required. So it essentially brings us into compliance with the, what the government does. And the issue is, is when, you know, somebody goes on maternity and they use sick leave, uh, we can't, until after 20 days, we can't hire a certified sub. Uh, first 20 days, it's just somebody from Holland. And after that, uh, we hire somebody at sub pay. It just presents, when you get on out there past 16 weeks, and you're still employing somebody on sub pay, you're not going to be able to attract the very best and brightest teacher. And secondly, it ultimately outcome, uh, impact the uh, learning ability of the child. So that's kind of the motivation here. How, how many of our teachers are using the full year? We have Paula. We kind of just went through that, not with a uh, maternity case, but with a teacher who took extended leave, and uh, parents were really kind of put out with us because we couldn't get a certified teacher in there, and ultimately did. Uh, it was costly, but we did. The other thing, and in, in for that particular portion that would change, uh, if, if you do make that change, is that rather than it being limited to um, licensed employees, it would apply to all employees because those are federal and state requirements, so. So the state requirements to do that to all employees? Well, you have to give at least the 16 weeks. Oh. So we had limited that section to certified employees because the one year was only given to certified employees. Again, just talking about the certified employees, does it make sense because of the unique nature of what we're doing to reference it to a semester change or a school year start or something like that. Ms. Barnes seems to, seems to indicate that sometimes people use that. I can certainly understand, you know, if you take leave in October and then you try and come back next October because you're taking a full year, that that's really inconvenient. Uh, you know, but if it's 16 weeks and, you know, we're, we're coming back in with three weeks left in the semester or something like that, it might make sense to tie it to a semester break or, or something of that nature. 
Well, federal law allows an employee to take the leave whenever they want to have it. So if they have a child and whenever, you know, November, they can take it 16 weeks from that right. point on, whether it, and that can happen, whether it's in December, even so but, the beginning of the year. But we could, at our discretion, extend it beyond the 16 weeks to a semester break. You could extend it. Well, you, you could, could make but, it any but once, once you open that can of worms, I think you're going to have, uh, you're, going to, you're going to create a situation for yourself. And I'd be reluctant personally to say, okay, we're going to give you three additional weeks because that'll, that'll get you to the semester, turn around uh, two weeks later and tell someone else, no, we're not going to do that. So I, I, well, think, and you, I think you would run into a situation too where some, some people might not want that extra three weeks. I mean, they may want to return to work so that they begin getting paid again. Mm -hmm. um, because a significant amount of people are on non-paid leave during that time. <clears throat> and somebody else might want the extra three weeks or so. Plus, it, I think it would be a nightmare to keep up with. Yeah. So the other thing that we wanted to consider in this policy is that we don't ha currently have any language that limits um, the amount of leave that can be taken uh, non-paid for extended illnesses. Um, and so what, I'll just give you an example, what might have happened a few times is that you'd have a custodian who had been diagnosed with a serious illness, they took eight months of leave, then were not allowed to return after that eight, or what, were not able to return after that eight months, so they extended another eight months and you are just without people for extended periods of time. <coughs> um, so we don't have anything currently that clarifies that. I did look at the city schools policy, <coughs> and what they require is that you can only take a maximum of two non-consecutive years of extended leave without pay in a career with the city school. So if you'd had an, an illness for an extended amount of time and had a year leave, and then a year later you had another year leave, then you couldn't take another extended leave after that or the position would be vacated at the point where you had to do that. So that was just something for consideration, but we, we struggle with that um, more and more because we have at this point allowed them to just continue to, to take leave, vacating, I mean, the position is then left open for. So there's nobody hired to fill in during the leave? If it's or? a custodian, they might be able to hire a temp for a period of time. Um, <coughs> sure. Have you seen any examples of more restrictive language than the two years? I haven't been able to find anything more restrictive than that. And a lot of people don't have language in a policy addressing that issue, mm -hmm. and this, they're in the same boat that we are, I assume, but um, that's the only, this is the only one that I could find that was available online. Read um, that back, Angel, please. A maximum of two non-consecutive years of extended personal leave without pay may be taken in a career with Murfreesboro City Schools. In no case may the personal leave include parts of two consecutive school years. But primarily, these are going to be people with serious illness, right? I mean, that would be why that leave would be right. approved. I don't know. Yeah. It makes it seem uh, sort of Scrooge-like, doesn't it? But well, on the other hand, there's a management problem. I understand that. There is. Frankly, the same thing for the maternity leave. I mean, mm -hmm. well, that, go ahead, Bob. I was just going to say, how would that impact anybody that's in the National Guard, reserves, things like that? Well, there's a separate provision for military leave, so it wouldn't wouldn't affect that. And you'd have to allow that, right? I think at one time we used to grant two years leave of absence, but uh, I think did not guarantee their position or the school. Is it two years or one year? We have allowed up to two years of leave at this point. Okay. 
and ask if, if, if they go beyond a two year period. No Most way. people have that. We just yeah. haven't had a firm uh, policy in place to handle those kind of situations. But with what we're addressing, Ms. Barnes, uh, when people take multiple long leaves, talk about the, the impact in the classroom. Carl, you had a question? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it just seems like <clears throat> uh, unemployment is nine to 10 percent. I mean, couldn't we create a qualified file of people that would be ready to step into those positions, especially if you have teachers that you are willing to wait a year or two year on because they're that good? Yeah, but the problem is you're paying multiple salaries. Uh, if they're using sick days or medical leave and uh, it's been extended for multiple months. We, it's, it's just not, it's truly not doable for us to hire somebody to take their place because you're essentially paying two salaries. And uh, we just don't have that luxury. Okay, I, maybe I misunderstood because I thought that that was a non-pay yeah. uh, right. time. That the, the city school's policy does say specifically non-paid. <clears throat> but we are addressing Certified too. Right. Yeah. With especially with the child care leave. Yeah. So these this proposal makes no distinction between paid and non paid. I mean it would affect any any leave regardless of whether it's paid or not. Is that Are you talking about the child care leave or Well just either one. The child care or the Well the child care leave would presumably be non paid because they would be past the point of right. medical necessity. But, yeah. um, but the the, what I'm talking about with illnesses specifically right, the, is that, I mean, they would have exhausted their leave time, so you would only be looking at the part that was not paid. Right. <clears throat> What's the wish of the committee? So we really aren't affecting the situation that Ms. Barnes described where we've got somebody who's taking sick days. That really doesn't fall into this because we're talking about non-paid leave beyond what they've already taken that. Is that yeah. correct? Medical leave, paid or unpaid. Paid or unpaid. Sick yeah. days or leave. Correct, because if you have if you're on medical leave and you had enough sick days built up to cover all of that leave, you would be getting paid. We'd be hiring in a substitute or a temporary person to handle that. But if you run out of sick days, you, you go into non-paid time, and then we you still have to bring in a person and pay them. But it's just it's a hardship. Of
Let me see if there's a second. We'll have more discussion. Is there a second? Second. Angel, you, 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 it's here, Paula. I know, yeah. why we, we anticipated if this if these changes were made it would go into effect next school year <coughs> we would have ample time to get that out to everybody and people haven't already planned on taking the year who are pregnant now mm -hmm. that kind of thing so I mean, we wouldn't want to hinder people who already had the anticipation that they could do that but to make it clear for so next anybody year. in this school year that was already <coughs> sort of thought in that direction right. will be allowed to continue in that direction that's well, that's the proposal yeah. but the okay. thought in that direction is different than being pregnant well, but if somebody is pregnant now and she's delivering okay. this school year. But well, you're not saying somebody plans to do no, it two no, years down the road. No, no. <laughs> when, when do they make well, application for leave? <laughs> when? How far out? We request that they make uh, application 30 days prior to their initial leave date. And then we know we always have to tweak that based on the actual delivery date. <coughs> okay. So the teachers seem to be okay with this. Am I interpreting that? No, well, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I have, a, if I've understood this correctly, I have a, a few questions and concerns about saying limiting a person who has built up a lot of sick days. If they've built up a year's worth of sick days, then that indicates to me that they've been a very dependable employee for several years. And we're saying now, you're sick, you have a doctor's excuse that says that you're not capable of working, and we're not going to allow you to use your sick days that you have built up over many years. That, that concerns me a little bit. Well, I, th I understand. I understand what you're concerned about, and I, I agree. I don't think we ought to limit people's ability to take the time that they've earned. I think that's why, in the city policy, they say no more than two years, because I mean, in, in reality, the fact that somebody would would have accumulated more than two years of sick leave while taking sick leave, I, I, mean, I can't imagine that would ever happen. But if if that is a concern, then you can limit it to. To time without pay. I mean, I, I know several people have a lot of sick time, yeah. but not more than two years. I mean, yeah. two years is a. Yeah. And if you're taking a year off or nine months off and depleting it as you go, then the, the chance that you accumulate more than two years at a time would be pretty slim. But, but if you're concerned about that, you could limit it to taking time without pay. I would feel more comfortable with that. I think that's a good change. I mean. It's not likely to affect the system much, but it might mean a great deal of the person. Uh, mm -hmm. So that has to be an amendment, Donald. Are you willing or to make Or can we that? withdraw the motion and the second is that possible? Either way. Either way. Yeah. I don't mind withdrawing my second. Yeah, I'll be well, willing to. Was the motion to approve the language in the city policy? Is that, is that what you're, because it yeah. says without pay. It, it says two consecutive years of personal leave without pay. So that would cover the situation. So that would cover that if that's okay. what you okay. intend to do. As long as, as long as we're not limiting those people who have built up all those 270 right. days of 
sick leave or something. It's a long career. It takes a long career to do that, doesn't it? That's right. Good attendance during that career. Oh, that's a good point. Right. And under their policy, they wouldn't even begin to count the two, the, the two years until you were without pay. Okay. So that's that's what happens most of the time. I mean, the vast majority of cases are the sick leave, is, sick leave is used up very early in the leave, and then it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Is it is it understood that the uh, maternity issue is for those who would make application uh, after August first, two thousand twelve? Is that acceptable? That, that will be if that's what we decide to do. Okay. So, if Wayne and Harry will unwithdraw their withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that didn't make much sense, did it? But we'll we'll presume that the original motion is still on the table. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Um, what about sick leave? Then? I mean, would there be any use for that? Because you can use all your sick leave and your sick leave benefits. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Well, I think that that. I mean, my interpretation. If you, if a teacher under that law is allowed to make application and they do and are granted sick leave, then that would be paid time. So that wouldn't go in, it wouldn't begin to count until they ran out of what they were doing sick leave from the sick leave bank. Is there a limit on how much an individual can get out of the bank or is that decided? 60 days a year. <clears throat> so what you're saying is that if, if they apply to the sick bank and get days, it's, it's just though they had built them up themselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we would be talking about time without pay. And presumably if they get time from the sick bank, that would be paid time. Okay, further discussion? The motion on the floor then is to adopt the, the changes as Angel has gone over them. So what, we, do we, we didn't add anything, did we, to what you said? I'm sorry. Okay. Wayne's motion is to adopt as you went through it. Right? Right. There's no amendment to that, I don't think. Okay. Are you ready to vote? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those say no. Motion's adopted. Number nine. Okay, number nine is policy 6.3090 zero tolerance offenses. And the proposed revision is that under on the second page, under other offenses, uh, we previously added the sexual misconduct provision in there, and we would also like to add bomb threat under zero tolerance. Um, and in the discussions that we've had about adding that to zero tolerance, it's the massive amount of time it takes mm -hmm. to handle those at a school, evacuating the building, law enforcement being involved. It's, it's hours um, and lots of movement among students. And um, so I think Mr. Gill just felt like that was a serious enough offense that it ought to be added to that. Are there other types of threats that would lead to an evacuation? <clears throat> Just curious if, if so, we might want to add them, but I don't know what that would be. I can't think of any. Hate to suggest any because we'll get it tomorrow. Yeah, well, that's what I'm yeah, thinking. I know it. Uh, or any kind of hazardous material or that might warrant an evacuating the school. The, yeah, well, that's what. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Would there be a way to change that wording to incorporate incorporate that? Are we? borrowing trouble. I mean, I suppose somebody could make a threat to... Extenders or biological threats. How about just threats? Because the, the... And I would like to change the comma to the word or because any student who makes threats or commits sexual misconduct and then the the... the the test is that result in students being criminally charged. So if they make a threat which results in criminal charges, that's when the zero tolerance would kick in. Because my next question was going to be, is it law enforcement's responsibility to uh, identify who made the threat, or is that internal Rutherford County Schools investigation as to identify that? You know, where is the where is the burden of proof? Well, what kind there? of threat are you talking about? Well, if it's a bomb threat, 
or if it's any kind of threat well, know, that re what results. Is any, what's any kind of threat? Example. It could be a biological threat. It could be. It would cover all threats that would result in criminal charges being filed. I don't think we really intended for criminal charges to be tied to the bomb threat. No, no, because no. that that is not always going to happen. How about saying here. threats that lead to the evacuation of the school? I mean, if you just say threats, it could be I'm going to come kick my teachers. You know, not that we would want, wouldn't be upset by that, but it wouldn't lead to the evacuation of the school. Threats that lead to the evacuation. And you know, if there's some other threat that doesn't fall under that umbrella, the principal has discretion to decide right. to remand them to the yeah. alternative school anyway. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're Any other tweaks? Somebody want to make a motion incorporating that? I don't know, like, did, did we in fact change the bomb threat at all or is it just remaining as is? I think we did, but that's to be decided by the motion that I hope somebody will make it. I think we agreed to say threats that result in the evacuation of the building. Right? Okay, that's what I was asking. Okay. Okay. Would you consider a suit upon the fire line? That's a good question, too. I've dealt with that one and we I mean, the act itself causes the evacuation. Mm -hmm. so. Is there anything in policy like one of the levels that addresses like something comparable to fire alarm? I don't think there is anything specific in the discipline code about pulling a fire alarm. I mean, Unless there is a category for disruption. We could say threats or actions that result. That's good. Yeah. I mean, do you want that to be a zero tolerance? Well, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just one. It's a good question. We don't want to get carried away. You don't want to put it in that category if that's not the punishment that you want to. But threats, oh, all I'm trying to say is threats occur in many different ways right. once you're trying to address it. Well, and, and that's why I think that it's important to tie it to criminal charges because if it's an inadvertent, if it's that, you know, sort of circumstance that we, we kind of see that pulling a fire alarm situation, then somebody exercises some discretion there about criminal charges. Likewise, if it is a bomb threat and we subpoena phone records or something like that through law enforcement in order to identify who that is, and we absolutely identify who that is through those measures, then we've got also the basis for you know, a zero tolerance offense. But to counter that, what if the SRO at Christiana Middle doesn't issue criminal charges mm -hmm. for a kid that does, and then the guy at Oakland Middle uh, does the exact opposite, which is possible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, and the difference all. then, their their level of proof in filing criminal charges is different than what satisfies our level for disciplinary reasons. So, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to recall the bomb threats that we've had. If charges have, I, I don't think charges have been filed in all of them. Well, I can say that under zero tolerance offenses, that there are times that the police don't feel like they have enough evidence or too many days have passed and like that. Mm -hmm. and they don't feel like they're to have enough to file a criminal charge that we have enough on ours. So we, in the past, we've not tied most of the zero tolerance offenses to criminal offenses with the exception of the sexual misconduct. That was the one exception for the mere reason. And we did that with the sexual misconduct one because that keeps us out of the somebody reports right. something, he said, she said, but the yeah. fact that it goes far enough for criminal charges to be filed make it serious enough for that, that level. Of, um, but in a bomb threat situation, either you're going to be able to identify who did it or you're not. Right. But you we know, don't have it, any control over whether it's charged But to be charged zero filed. tolerance is obviously a, a serious offense. I mean, when we zero tolerance somebody, that's a big deal now. You know, you got a sixth grader walking down the hall and somebody challenges him, pull the fire alarm. You know, kid never done anything. I mean, does that necessarily warrant a zero tolerance is, is what kind of scares me. It may warrant, like you said, I've got two examples. One that clearly would have, I would have sent the car to the last thing I'm going to do. And one other one was especially a student just because we've been talking about the fire and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Just the discretion. But in both cases, it resulted in school evacuation. Yes, sir. Well, we don't want to tie the principal's no, no. hands, you yeah. know. Don't. You know, 
zero tolerance, Mr. Gill said, is for very serious offenses. And if we keep expanding that out to so many offenses, then the effectiveness of that being a deterrent for students is lessened, in my opinion. So I, I feel like that if you're going to, you, you can suspend a student up to 10 days out of his home school. Is that not still true? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about expanding the zero tolerance over and over again, because if we're doing that, then we've got to have a place for those students. And we've got to, and it's got to be a place that uh, will carry on and, uh, and be in a, an environment that would be a deterrent from them wanting to come back and repeat those offenses. So I have a, I have a concern about that. Uh, you know, we have added a lot of things to zero tolerance as, as the years have gone on. And I, I think the principal and the director of schools still should have some options with those suspensions. If you zero tolerance something, then it takes options away from you basically, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And ultimately, if a kid's zero tolerance for most of those infractions, not necessarily in the case of a bomb threat, it may warrant additional thought, but we typically, unless they're carrying a weapon, threaten a teacher, uh, selling, selling drugs, you know, we typically remand them to the alternative school because it is a second chance school. So, and you have that option with the kid that fires the fire, fire alarm anyway. And as Mr. Journey has said, it still leaves you the option to suspend and to do something else up. Can you put some verbiage in there about principal's recommendations <coughs> to that? I don't know if you can with zero, zero tolerance. tolerance. You can't with zero tolerance. That's pretty well cut and dry. Well, that would be a level four offense. Any of those that we discussed, which uh, you know, that Sunday one before certainly remand is one of the options. Yeah. I think it's, a lot of it's covered. But it, originally we talked about bombs. Right. Now we got the basically biological. We've gone all the way around, so we yeah. still have no motion. Um, or you just want to leave it alone, or? You know, I, I personally like your original, and it's just my thinking, and uh, I like your original idea. I also appreciate, I mean, respect what Mr. Jernigan says. You know, do we need to keep expanding zero tolerance to where it includes everything under the sun? Uh, especially when the principal has options at their disposal. But I do like the fact that a, a bomb threat can really essentially uh, disable the operation for the better part of the day, mm -hmm. as happened at Oakland. And to me, it's much more serious than a, pulling a fire alarm, even though that's serious. So maybe we ought to go back to bomb threat. Somebody thought. want to make a motion? <laughs> I move we. Uh, make a motion, you know? I'm not. The last one I made, I had to with, withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> but then we unwithdrew. I'm I not mean, doing any more motions. <laughs> I move we uh, we adopt the motion as written. Okay. For us. Okay. Any more discussion? So this would leave it at bomb. The inclusion of bomb threats, and we'll deal with the fire alarms and the anthrax at a later date. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Uh, opposed say no, motion's adopted. Number 10. Okay, number 10 is 1.103, board self-evaluation and Dr. Burns as we include this on the agenda. Right, and I've forgotten now what, this has been a couple months ago we talked about this, what was the, the change in, I'm sorry, I don't remember. I, I think we really were just discussing whether it was needed policy or not, if it was something the board wanted so to continue to do okay. or, or not do. At the time, Dr. Burns, I remember uh, 
conversation about the board will conduct an evaluation yeah. versus the board may conduct an evaluation. The language. Right. I mean, it's right now it's restrictive. It shall do this. It says and will. Correct. And if we, we could either change it to will or we could strike the entire policy or we could leave it alone. But I mean, that in terms of giving us a little more flexibility. Or you could say may. The board may conduct. Right. I like leaving it alone. I'm not as enthused about the self-evaluation process, but I don't object to uh, doing it every year if that's the will of the committee. I'd, I'd like to hear some from someone outside the committee to see how, how someone else feels that, how important it is that we self-evaluate. You mean someone outside the board? <coughs> Out, uh, outside the board, I'm sorry. That's what I meant to say. Thank you, Wayne. I'm here for you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember that in your next self-evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, in, in all honesty, I mean, it, it, does, it, does it matter to anybody on that side of the table if the board self-evaluates? That's, that's maybe what I'm looking for. I'll have my opinion, but I'm not going to speak well, more. But you're on the board. You can't <laughs> no, I can't, I can't speak. Our two uh, community uh, members probably would be best served to speak I'm quite to sure that. they were eagerly awaiting the results. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I prefer to give the board more flexibility, and we would do that by saying may, but um, that's not the world's biggest issue either. Other board members or committee members? Yes, ma'am. We have one. We do. We do. Okay. And then, what do you do if if you do perform an evaluation? What do you do with that information? We give it to the news journal. <laughs> <laughs> and the TSB. No, I'm I'm, the I'm, TSBA. Uh, I'm making too much too well, light of it. I guess the how often? The, 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 the thing. Right. We've done it twice now, and and the. I think the, the theory is, and to some degree maybe it's worked, I don't know, but it helps us identify areas in which we might improve as a board. That's the theory behind it. Now whether or not the practice of it has led to us making changes, I don't know. You know, Dr. Burns, when she asked that question, what do you do with it, that brought up, this was one of the reasons why we did have it. The eva uh, letter B, evaluation shall be at a scheduled time with no other items on the agenda and with that all is, board that, members present. Thank you, Aaron. That's, That's that the was thing my, that, that we really did have a problem with. We saw no reason to encumber the county with a special call meeting just to evaluate uh, right. that. And so even if we leave the language restrictive that says that the board must every year perform a self-evaluation, we did not see a reason to have a special meeting with no other items on the agenda yeah, to right. review that evaluation. Uh, and I think it would be appropriate to strike letter B. I agree. So I would move that uh, board uh, policy 1.103 as written with letter B stricken. So we'd still do the evaluation, but we would not have to have a special meeting to discuss the results. I think I think that's a reasonable compromise. Did you get my second? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion's adopted. Okay. Number 11 is 2.805 purchasing. <clears throat> and in this policy, again, because of auditing requirements, we have added starting at line 28, at no time shall an employee make purchases of personal items using a school's credit card, debit card, check, petty cash, cash collections, etc., even if the intent is to reimburse the school. And then line 31, employees shall not use the schools or school systems tax exempt status for making personal purchases. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Has there been any uh, alleged violation of that? Yeah. 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 
Yes. 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 <coughs> I thought that was the answer. Other discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. say no. Motion is adopted. Number 12. Number 12 is 1.108 nepotism. Uh, and if you recall, we amended this policy several months ago. Um, and then looking, going back and looking at it, Dr. Burns uh, noticed that there was some repetitive language. Um, there was an additional paragraph, again, clarifying that members of the immediate family should not be assigned to the staff in the same school unless some unusual exertion. So we just deleted that paragraph. It's very plain and clear now. Um, yeah, so what, what you have is the new policy. We didn't change the content or no. really the rules in any way. We just took out some excess and confusing verbiage. It really just repeated that paragraph yeah, in different ways. Yeah, redundancy. Language. Pardon? Redundancy. Yeah, that's... Thank you, Don. You're welcome. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion's adopted. Thirteen. Okay, Thirteen is social media. Uh, and what I have, I, I didn't have any idea what direction we wanted to go with this. So what I've given you are copies of a policy, a draft policy that the city schools looked at. And I don't think they've adopted it. And then the second thing that you have are the Metro Nashville guidelines for system use of social media. So I didn't know if we were going towards regulating employee use or system use. So kind of we've gathered a, a wide variety of policies. I'd also add, I don't know if it'd be helpful, but I asked, I sent James to a social media uh, conference, two separate ones that included uh, a lot of information on social media. So he's actually the resident authority on it. But, uh, is this a good time for you to jump in, James? Yeah, uh, is that all right? Tell us what, yeah, please, yeah. tell us what you know, James. Or you can just tweet it to us. <laughs> See how I'm, I'm incorporating that, the lingo. I'm proud of you. Thanks. Um, I don't have toys. Well, so. The conferences that Mr. Godby attend dealt with the school district and schools using social media, not necessarily how they, the policies on employee use. So on, on that issue is um, a lot of school districts are, are experimenting with it around the country. Uh, there, are, there are a few here in, in the Middle Tennessee area. Metro is very progressive with their policy. They use four different types of social media to, to um, th there's a lot of different things we could or couldn't do depending on uh, the direction of the board. The, the, the positive of it is it's kind of the difference between um, getting information in the mail, which requires you to open it and, and instead of throwing away, or seeing a commercial on television, which is something that you're, you're already watching television and the message comes during the, the, you know, the middle of the program. That's the, kind of the difference between traditional communication and social media. If someone has a Facebook page, for example, and we had a presence on Facebook and we wanted to push out a message to parents about something, when they open their Facebook page, which a lot of younger families do that now, and I guess older, older too, it would be waiting for them. They would have to go and find the information on a website or through uh, an email or something like that. Uh, I can give you as much or as little information as you want, though, so I'm not really sure where you want to go with this. Well, Aaron, this is on here to suggest. May I ask yeah, please. Yeah. But with respect to this whole social media, uh, so we've got parent portal, we've got messenger system, we've got school websites, uh, you know, all those uh, are electronic. How's it going to benefit us anymore? Uh, and answer this sincerely. Uh, how's it going to benefit us anymore to be a, to have these opportunities? Well, social media is very proactive. Uh, like I was saying before, uh, it doesn't require the parents to do anything different than what they're already doing. The, the information is waiting for them. It doesn't require them to go seek it somewhere else. Uh, some of our other department does it as well. Phone calls are the same way. I mean, they don't have to call us to get the information. We're we're calling them. Uh, it's it's very efficient. Uh, I'm obviously uh, in favor of it, but let, let me just so, so know that going into this, but. Uh, it's, it's very um, efficient in that you can send out information very quickly. Um, like for a phone call, for example, to make 39,000 phone calls, it takes approximately an hour, depending on how much phone traffic is tying up the lines. Uh, social media, it's, it's instant. You know, as soon as we push out the message, uh, you know, 
matter of seconds. But would the same 39,000 people get it? Those who would follow us would, you know, they would have to. But they'd have to have what, a smartphone or, or what else? Television Absolutely. or a computer? A smartphone or, or through their computer, right. So obviously everybody doesn't have a smartphone or a computer, right. so that, that would be a. Do we I don't think we'd replace the phone did, calls we I'm just talked about. Kind of yeah. yeah. I mean, do we need to have a policy regarding utilization by the system? I mean, if it's something that's effective, I mean, I mean, I would think the only issue that we would have as policy is if there was misconduct right. using social media. So I, I'm not sure. Well, that's kind where of what Angel was talking about in the beginning. As it relates to this, I mean, is there an opportunity for response by parents, by stakeholders, uh, to whatever electronically disseminated? Something that's key if, if the district decides to, to pursue social media is to have two things in place. One is training for schools so they know how to use it, the, the ins and outs, the do's and don'ts, things like that. And then the second big piece that most school districts have is what they, they develop what's called rules of engagement. So it very clearly defines for people interact with us on social media, uh, what is and is not appropriate, how we handle issues. So if I post something on our Facebook page and Mr. Blair were to put something that's inappropriate, the rules of engagement will be posted on that page so that when he gets his comment removed, he knows that's why he got it removed. Yeah, Things like, like that. So kind of the exactly. ground rules are, are, are laid out there for everyone so that it's very clear how we use it and, and how we don't use it. Uh, those are two important pieces. So it's not something you want to my opinion do is a knee-jerk reaction you want to make sure that you have all this in place uh, so that when we, if, if we did launch this sort of presence that you know we would uh, not have any negative effects on that right off the bat but in connection with yeah. his questions I don't know and, and I'll turn it over to you Aaron just a second yeah. uh, in connection with your comment Wayne I don't know that it would warrant that we do anything in policy either but I think Laverne High School and maybe one other school are doing social media aren't they they are experimenting with yes yeah sir. And, and there are a number of clubs as well, team sports and like that, that are already yeah. kind of has some underground pages going and things like right. that. Aaron. Originally, the intent of getting this on the agenda was for this kind of examination and, and, and that we, we pay it some attention. Uh, as I've thought about this, it seems inappropriate for the board to weigh in on the specific uh, guidelines as to use and uh, training and all of those kind of things. What seems appropriate from a board perspective in policy is that we clarify for all people who come in contact with Rutherford County Schools that we consider activity on social media to be a documented uh, statement. And as such, that behavior is subject to our employment guidelines and regulations. If someone says something inappropriate in the classroom, then the repercussions are by policy. But if they say something inappropriate in their home, it's outside of the school. Where the gray area is, if they say something in their home, on social media, on a site, or tied to a site that is somehow related to Rutherford County Schools, do we consider that as a board as conduct that calls their behavior into question or is that conduct outside of school hours? I think that that is a board policy that should be looked at and can be a clear line of when you, when you uh, put your behavior out there in social media, are you subject to uh, repercussions in your employment. So you're, I'm sorry. No, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. So you're saying, for example, a teacher comments on a post made on a, by the principal of the school, a comment from home on Facebook, is that what you're getting at? Right. If they, if they say in their classroom to their students or to a fellow teacher, I think the principal's a jerk, then that's insubordination. And we have policies and guidelines to deal with that. But if they say that on Facebook or if they say that on Twitter, is that just as culpable uh, because they've said it in that format, which is absolutely directly tied to their identity and the employer, and yet are they culpable? 
Well, it sounds like some free speech issues to me. I mean, yeah. unless you somehow are doing it with school property. I mean, that's why I ask if you're talking about in response to a post made on a school Facebook. But I mean, if they just go on their personal Facebook and say the principal's a jerk, well, it's not very smart, but I'm not sure if there's anything we can do. That's the very issue that the city schools, that's why they halted right. moving forward and so they're still studying it because of those, those same arguments. The issue is going to get more complex. I see things now like they can read about instruction. Um, what we used to say about 250 word uh, report on every length of the Emancipation Proclamation. You're seeing things like now students create a Facebook, or Abraham Lincoln create a Facebook page mm -hmm. stating your position on the Emancipation Proclamation. So uh, as times have changed, you're going to see major changes in, in how this is used and done. That also is a is a is a second issue is uh, where and by what means uh, does the school system open up? We've opened up access to Twitter. We've not yet opened up access to Facebook. Uh, you know, as far as the the online applications and such. I don't know if necessarily the board needs to weigh in, except to say the board embraces social media or does not. And in that regard, we give direction to the director then to, to make the, the individual decisions. There's a, there's a broad picture there, but I still say that I, I don't know that it wouldn't be inappropriate, maybe it would, Jeff, I'd take your advice on this, for us to say we consider the postings by Rutherford County school system employees to be reflective of their employment. And as such, you know, they could face disciplinary action for inappropriate statements. You know, you have to couch it in, I mean, the First Amendment implications of all that are pretty broad. Mm -hmm. So to couch that in terms that would fly and be uh, sustainable, um, given the First Amendment, would be difficult to do. You could look at possibly coming up with some language um, that, um, that would say that they should not use, you know, um, well, the thing expletives or inappropriate um, um, language that would otherwise be inappropriate in school in the context of a public forum. Um, but even when you're getting to that, I think you're going to have First Amendment issues on that. Profanity, things like that, um, are hard things to regulate um, outside of the school context. And yet, I've rec I recall that we have dismissed volunteer coaches based on evidence in social media. And so, you know, in, in one way we're kind of using it there to identify a potential problem, and yet we're unwilling to say if you misbehave as an employee, you know. So I, I just wanted to clear it up. It, it is definitely great. Well, volunteer coaches are not employees. So when you eliminate their ability to volunteer coach, I wouldn't say it's a dismissal because they're not an employee, but when you say you're not eligible to participate as a volunteer coach, you're not taking anything away from them. They're not losing a position, they're not losing pay, they're not losing benefits. So the ramifications for that are very, very little. It's a situation where you decide it's just not worth taking a chance over. They're not an employee, we're not taking anything away from them. So, I mean, we've had that discussion over and over again, but when you get into a situation with an employee, you are taking from them. You are taking you get into these kinds of situations, you're taking benefits, you're taking an employment contract, lots of things that could have pretty large implications. Um, and even the city schools policy that they consider, which they have not gone as far to adopt, limits. what The only things that they talk about limiting are confidentiality of student records, health records and personnel information, confidentiality of district records, including evaluations and private email addresses and copyrights. I mean, they limit it to things that they are bound, that employees are bound by policy not to disclose. So, and, I, and, it, and our understanding is even at that limiting language, they've decided at this point not to move forward because of the implications that it could have in terms of free speech. So, well, hypothetically Mimi. speaking, if you're on the school system, the school webpage, could that not serve to manage and have the umbrella of all the rules and regulations? excuse me, regarding speech. If you're commenting on that page, then all of the rules and regulations that fall be in the place. school fall. But if you're on your private page, <clears throat> then you have free speech. But if you're on the, the school page, you follow those school rules. 
Yeah, and we've got policy in place that mm -hmm. regulates that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, moving forward, you know, with, with the Facebook, one thing that concerns me as a parent is Facebook is continually changing its own privacy settings. I mean, there's a, a legal case right now that was just settled uh, with the FCC, and they don't seem to be stable enough, really, for me. And what if, um, to, to parent with Mr. Gill said, what if the um, student doesn't have a smartphone or um, access to Facebook? Is that going to be detrimental for him or not, to not be able to get on um, the page? If the teacher wants to set up some, everybody doesn't do Facebook. Some students, some parents hold the student back from accessing it. Well, we're obviously not going to vote on anything tonight. I, I guess the, I don't, Jeff, is there value in the board uh, even having a policy that is empty, but that expresses the sentiment of the board that there be extreme caution by employees in this. Uh, you know, I guess we could do a resolution in a regular board meeting, but it doesn't have the same lasting impact that a policy does that that lays there. If you, if you, and I think we're talking about a couple of different things because what I'm hearing is kind of we're talking about social media in general and whether or not the school should be encouraged to use social media and use that as a means of communication with parents and students. Yeah. And that's one aspect of what right. we're dealing with. The second aspect of what uh, we're dealing with is what you just immediately focused on with respect to to what extent do you regulate employees' uh, communications through social networking um, that may reflect back on the school system. Uh, and I think, um, you know, whether or not the, the school system should be encouraged to use um, social media or not, I think really that's really not a policy issue. That's just a practical matter. It should be left to the schools and mm -hmm. they develop that and they want to go that direction. That's something that will develop on its own um, just as the nature of the media develops on its own. So that's something that will evolve and change and issues with respect to that five years from now are going to be a lot different <coughs> than they are even today. Right. But with respect to the issue of trying to put some broad policy in place saying that, and we say that, you know, school personnel are reminded that any statements they may make through social media may be a reflection upon the school system. They should be um, careful with respect to use, utilizing um, uh, appropriate language, avoiding profanity, things like that. I think a general policy like that would be okay, so long as it not, does not provide for disciplinary type conduct um, or any kind of repercussion for the employees. But you know, I don't know if that really has any teeth teeth to it at that point. It's just a general statement of acknowledging that social media is out there and our employees are reminded the fact that any comments they may make on Facebook may be a reflection upon themselves and the school system as a teacher or for every employee. And please keep that in mind when you make these communications through Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And, and we do that annually through right. our well, I was gonna say, yeah. ethics training is, each fall. Yeah. And we always tie, we use specific scenarios, we change them up every year. Right. Um, and we always tie it to the statutory reasons for dismissal. So, and, and one of those is they, you know, teachers are required to abide by the, test, the code of ethics. We always tie it back to that. That covers some of that kind of, you know, what you do in your personal life is reflective of what, have, what you do in the school system. And so we always tie it to those things. Principals are required to cover those every year with teachers, you know, at the first faculty meeting of the year. I mean, we do that every year, um, reminding them that there are situations where things that you do in your private life can reflect and cause you issues in your, um, in your professional life. So, I don't remember it being a big issue anyway. I've never, I don't think I've had, and it may be, but I, I don't remember having anything recorded about the teachers doing on Facebook. Do you? The, the issue we were most concerned with in, in doing the training was limiting correspondence between professionals and students <coughs> and how you correspond. I mean, that's what we've, we've focused on because those are the things we've kind of had issues with. But just in terms of um, you know, people complaining about what somebody posted, I, we haven't had, to my knowledge, any issues with that. James, do you anticipate with the training that you've seen that there's need for a uh, specific addendum or something in, in the... Uh, manuals, not policy, but the, the you know the employment manuals or something that, that 
relate to how we're going to use Twitter and how we're going to use these ones that we've opened up? Uh, you mean as a district or as personal use? A uh, district. Uh, what I've seen typically is they put it in, in we, different districts call it different things. Metro calls it their guidelines. So they have it in guidelines, not in policy. We would probably call it administrative procedure. So it, it, something like that. that. That way the director of schools has, has enough fluidity about it that he can change it, you know, on a moment's notice if need be. To respond to those sorts of situations. Again, it's called administrative policy. What is it called? Procedures. Administrative procedures. Administrative maybe. procedures. So you expect that there'll be a section in there for uh, Twitter and such, and how I we interact. We'll with talk it. about it for right. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, the next one. <laughs> we took care of supplements. So right. moving on to 15. Yes, um, travel reimbursement. And this will be a new policy 2.8001. We have always had this in administrative procedure, um, but again, federal auditors and, and accounting guidelines are requiring it to be in a policy. So things we've been doing, just creating a policy rather than a, a procedure. Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. All right. Opposed say no. Motion's adopted. 16. Okay, 16 uh, is a new policy as well. 2.8051. Credit cards, debit cards, gift cards, and online banking use. And again, this is, I think, a requirement from accounting guidelines that we establish a policy uh, related to these, these types of financial issues. Um, and this came from specifically uh, information that Jeff gave me related to what they were, were given. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion's adopted. Anything else? Angel, thank you for your hard work on this, and Jeff, thank you for your role. Thank you all for coming tonight and serving on this committee, and we are adjourned.